Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to What's Up Doc. My name is Tia Teriak, and I am pleased to uh, welcome you here to Concord Hospital for our terrific luncheon program. Uh, we would like to recognize and thank the Walker Lecture Series for their generous sponsorship of What's Up Doc. The Walker Lecture Series offers lectures on history, literature, art, and science, as well as dramatic, musical, and literary performances. All events are free to the public, and they're held at the Concord City Auditorium. We encourage you to check out their website at walkerlecture.org to view their calendar of programs. And they just recently released their fall programs. Um, so take a look, please. Today, our program is on a very timely topic. Heart disease is currently the leading cause of death in New Hampshire for both men and women. To help us understand more about our risks for heart disease and what we can do about it, we're very pleased to have Dr. Ryan Van Hoff here today as our guest speaker for What's Up Doc. Dr. Van Hoff is from the Cardiovascular Institute, Concord Hospital's Cardiovascular Institute. He graduated from Sydney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University. He completed both his residency and a fellowship at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. Dr. Van Hoff is board certified in cardiovascular disease, internal medicine, nuclear cardiology, and he is also a diplomate in adult comprehensive echocardiography. Wow. When he's not caring for patients, Dr. Van Hoff has four children that keep him very busy between the ages of four and 12. He loves being outdoors, hiking, biking, and he also coaches soccer in the fall. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ryan Van Hoff. Thank you, Tia. Yeah, this is, uh, this is much more relaxing than uh, home. I come to work to <laughs> get a break. Um, so uh, they, they, when they asked me if I would mind talking, you know, I, I said absolutely. Um, I, I'm a general cardiologist for reference, so I don't do any of the fancy procedures uh, that some of my colleagues do. Um, I see people here in the hospital who are sick with all sorts of things, and I see folks over in the clinic, and I do a lot of uh, cardiac testing and that sort of thing. Um, in uh, this forum in the past, we've heard from, uh, we heard from Dr. Chodosh, uh, one of my colleagues who can implant little devices by going into a blood vessel in the leg to reduce your risk of stroke. We heard from uh, Dr. Magnus who goes in through a blood vessel in the leg and puts in new valves. We heard from Dr. Ferguson who goes in through a blood vessel in the leg and puts in these little heart pumps to help us uh, support people who are you know, really ill or, or needing emergent surgery. Um, so you'd be forgiven if uh, you thought that we were going to be going into a blood vessel in the leg to help prevent heart disease, but this is, this is not quite so sexy um, as, as any of those other things that, that we can do. Um, but I would argue that it's uh, much more important uh, if you look sort of at the big picture. Um, so uh, moving on here. So what we're going to talk about is first, you know, briefly what is heart disease and specifically blood vessel disease because that's what we're going to focus. That's when, when people say heart disease, that's usually what they're referring to when they say you know, it's the leading cause of death uh, in New Hampshire, the United States, and, and many parts of the world. Um, and then I want to spend some time sort of understanding um, or, or thinking about how we understand our patients' risk of heart disease, um, either you know, by, by history, by, by other risk factors, uh, using risk calculators, to talk a little bit about um, for whom additional testing might be helpful in understanding that risk or looking for uh, heart disease. Um, and then I want to spend some time on talking about uh, how we can reduce the risk of heart disease. Um, most of this is going to apply to people who don't carry a diagnosis of heart disease or heart blood vessel disease. But I would say that the, the latter part there, uh, reducing the risk of heart disease, applies to everybody. So even if you've had a heart attack or stents in the past or know someone who has, uh, these are still things that are important, that are helpful, um, and that are, are worth uh, having a good uh, understanding of. 
So basically, uh, you know, starting from what is the heart, I think we all have a general sense of what it is. Um, it is relatively simple, honestly. It's not the most complicated organ in the body. I'd say it's maybe the second most important after the brain. It pains me to say that, but uh, I'm, I'm fond of it. Um, <laughs> it's not that big. It, it's surprisingly small. If you're in the operating room, you look at look in someone's chest, it's not a big thing, but it's, but it's really important. If you make a fist, it's about that size, honestly. If you have smaller hands like I do, it's maybe a little bigger than that, but, but it's, not, it, it's not a big organ. And it's basically just a muscle. It's a pump, right? So it's a muscular pump. It squeezes. It sends blood you know, through the body. Blood comes back to the heart from the veins, from, from the body to what we call the right atrium, flows into the right ventricle, and gets pumped out to the lungs. And then it comes back to the from the lungs to the left atrium. It's hidden behind there to this left ventricle, which we often talk about as sort of the main pumping chamber of the heart. And that left ventricle does most of the work, and it sends blood to the whole body. Um, the heart has an electrical system, which uh, basically tells it when to beat. Uh, and it has these valves in here that keep blood flowing in the right direction. And then it has a plumbing system, for lack of a better term, um, that brings blood to the heart. The oxygen-rich blood is, is the fuel for the heart that keeps the pump working. And you can have problems in sort of any one of those, those areas, right? The, the pump can be weak for many reasons. Uh, you can have electrical problems of many, many different kinds. Um, and then you can have issues with those blood vessels that bring blood to the heart. And when we talk about heart disease, that, those blood vessels, they, they lay on the outside of the heart. That's what we're mostly talking about, right? So if you don't have good blood flow to the heart, then the pump can't work appropriately or you can have symptoms like chest pain um, or, or a heart attack and, and that sort of thing. So broadly speaking, that falls under what we call atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which is basically fancy doctor talk for blood vessel disease anywhere in the body, right? So this is, you know, we're, I, I focus on the heart because that's my, my area of, of specialty, my area of expertise. But much of what you're talking about that affects the heart blood vessels affects the blood vessels everywhere else, right? So the blood vessels in the brain, uh, the blood vessels in your, your legs, your arms, the, the gut. Um, some of the terms that you may hear me use, and I'll try to be consistent, um, but, but atherosclerotic heart disease would be sort of specifically to the heart. We also call it coronary artery disease, the, the coronary arteries being the blood vessels that bring blood uh, to the heart. Um, and you can have issues with those pipes, with those blood vessels, in sort of one of two ways. You can have chronic heart blood vessel disease, so blood vessel disease that develops slowly over time and is sort of stable, not really doing anything, but can limit flow to the heart. And then a heart attack, which is a sudden change in those blood vessels, a sudden blockage that, that restricts blood flow to the heart. Cerebral vascular disease refers to blood vessels in the, the neck and the brain, so the carotid arteries. The, the brain arteries, those are the arteries that are affected when people have stroke. And many of the same things that will affect your risk of heart blood vessel disease will also weigh in and have an effect on, on brain blood vessel disease or peripheral vascular disease. So the blood vessels, most commonly we're referring to the blood vessels that go all the way down to the legs. Those are the longest ones that have the, the furthest to go. And so when people have problems with peripheral vascular disease, uh, it, it tends to be down there. So when we're talking about blood vessel disease, this is fairly consistent across different vascular areas, different, you know, in the heart, the brain. What, what happens is a normal artery looks like up there on the, on the top right, um, where you have sort of a, a layer of smooth muscle that can help contract and, and close the arteries. And then there's a thin lining that we call the intima. And everyone has circulating cholesterol and fats and things that are, are moving through those blood vessel systems. And that can start to build up under the blood vessel wall. It can build up, and you get what we call plaques, right? And you can see that these plaques will narrow in these arteries. And it's much more complicated than this, because the arteries can also dilate if they start to have plaque build up. But what can happen, basically, is the plaque can either form, and then if it gets weak, it can rupture and cause a sudden blockage. So this would be an example of what's happening during a heart attack. And those plaques can also 
over time become more stable and get calcified and, and almost turn to like bone and be very hard to, to do anything about. They end up being very stable and they're much less likely to rupture. So those, that would be more of the, the chronic uh, blood vessel issue. All right. So why do we care about this? T actually touched on this originally. This is the highest, one of the most common causes of death worldwide. About a quarter of all deaths in the United States are attributable to heart disease, either heart attacks, strokes, um, you know, chronic heart artery disease, disease in other territories. And honestly, almost just as importantly, um, people who have blood vessel disease, it, it can affect your life in a lot of different ways, right? So we, we all have known people who have had heart attacks and have not been able to then do the things they wanted to do following their heart attack. Many people will make a full recovery, but it can affect your heart's function, leading to heart failure, where the pump itself can't work as well anymore because it's not getting blood in that muscle. That part of the pump has essentially died. Um, and it can also cause things like chest discomfort if you, when you try to exert yourself. And that can be limiting, and it can prevent you from doing what you want to do. Stroke, obviously, uh, can lead to deficits in, in speech, in mobility, um, and that can be quite disabling as well. So first, there's a lot of things that kind of play into this. These are complicated processes. It's not so simple as just cholesterol builds up and then it happens. We have a pretty good understanding of, of a lot of the things that kind of play into this. And it's important to understand these factors that, that um, can affect your development of heart disease because then we can understand how to modify them and how to lower your risk. Um, so I would point out that a few of these here I would consider not modifiable, right? So your, your age is your age. And the goal of this is for it to keep going up, right? Um, we all want to keep getting older. And that's the whole point of you know, medicine in general is to, to get older and stay healthy. Um, your race, so uh, African Americans have higher rates of heart disease. Um, and that's probably mediated genetically. Uh, Southeast Asians also higher rates of heart disease mediated genetically. Nothing you can do about that, right? Your, your family history is your family history. If, if you're, everyone in your family died young of heart attacks, well, there's some mechanism. We may not know exactly why, but you can't do anything about that. Um, and so what I tell folks is don't perseverate on that. Just take that as motivation to focus on the things that you can modify. So I would consider you know, these lifestyle factors, things like smoking and diet and, and exercise or activity, as things that are modifiable, right? So, you know, th these are things where we can affect your risk of having heart disease or developing, you know, or, or progressing heart disease that you already have. And so this is where I would really say that you as a patient can focus your time and your attention. These are things that you can do stuff about. And then on, on top here are lots of medical conditions, right? We know that people who have high blood pressure high cholesterol, diabetes, chronic kidney disease. Um, there are many other ones that I didn't list up here, inflammatory conditions like psoriasis or rheumatoid arthritis. A lot of these things can affect your risk of heart disease, can raise that risk. Um, and these are things that you may not necessarily be able to do something about directly yourself. A lot of these lifestyle factors will play into the, the medical conditions. You know, if you, if you eat well, then you'll be less likely to develop those things. Um, but these are, are areas where your doctors can help you with other medication or other treatments to, to lower your risk. Um, I, would, I would say sort of added to that list, there are other things uh, like environmental factors, right? So, so folks who live in, in bigger cities or who are exposed to pollution, um, their risk is going to be higher. Uh, socioeconomic factors are also a risk. So that by no means was that a complete list, um, but that's sort of a, a place to start. So how do we help patients understand their risk specifically? Um, and we're going to go through a bunch of different ways that we do that to, to screen uh, and, and test folks for blood vessel disease. And we'll go through these one by one. Um, I'll, spoiler, uh, some of these are useful and some of them are not. Okay, so these are all things that we can do and sometimes do do, and sometimes we should, and some of these things you don't need, right? So the most important thing that we do in general is try to understand your risk by understanding your risk factors, right? So your risk is unique to you, um, and 
uh, we can try to get a sense of that um, using, uh, this is the, what we call the heart risk calculator. So this was designed by the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association going back about, I think, 2013 is when they first put it out, and they've adjusted it as we get more data. And the idea here was to say, can we put a number on your individual risk, right? So you can, uh, you know, if you come to me and you're a 64-year-old smoker with terribly controlled diabetes and a horrible family history, well, I can tell you your risk is pretty high, but how about people who don't have those things? How about just, you know, everyone who's walking around on the street who's maybe getting a little older, maybe their blood pressure is a little bit on the high side, maybe their cholesterol is not perfect. How do we understand their risk and, and what should we do about it? Um, so this doesn't come across all that well, but you can see here that the factors that go into this risk calculator are your age. And I would bring it, no one here looks like they're over the age of 79, but if anyone happens to be, the upper margin for this calculator is 79. They just didn't, there's not enough information on older folks to say that it's really, it's, it's useful, but I, I still think it is. What I do in that situation is I just put 79. To let, it, to let it work and then say, well, your risk might be a little bit different than that. Um, gender, uh, so again, a non-modifiable characteristic. Men have higher rates of heart disease, particularly in young adulthood. As women become postmenopausal, they start to catch up, but they never really do. Uh, race matters. Um, and then it has a couple of values, and these are things that you would get either at your doctor's office or by blood test. So you're putting your total cholesterol and your, your HDL or your good cholesterol, and then your blood pressure. And so those are sort of a, the hard numbers that you need to put into this calculator. And then whether or not you're on treatment for blood pressure, whether you're a diabetic or whether you're a smoker. So missing from this calculator are a lot of the things on the last slide, right? Missing is family history, missing are uh, some other, other medical conditions like kidney disease. So this is by no means you know, a, a hard and fast you know, it's, gonna, it's not going to give you, it will give you a very precise number, but that number might not be accurate, right? So it's going to give you a number, but your actual risk is you know, probably somewhere in that ballpark. So it's a good way of approximating your risk and, and getting a sense of whether you should uh, be doing anything about it. So just for an example, and I, and I do this all the time in my office for folks who are concerned. They say, all right, am I, am I at risk? I don't have any disease. My dad died at 66 of a sudden heart attack. Should I be worried? <laughs> And so we'll, we'll go through this exercise. Um, and what it does is it will it'll characterize your risk as basically low, intermediate, or high. And so a high risk patient would have a greater than 20% risk of heart attack, stroke, um, blockage somewhere else over the next 10 years. Right? So this is sort of a longer term prognosis. You know, do I need to be worried about developing a heart problem in the next 10 years or so? And this is a way to guesstimate that. They sort of arbitrarily pick those, those numbers um, in part based on data from a lot of trials where we were looking at predominantly cholesterol lowering medications to, to see how we can affect people's risk. Um, and then they decided if it's more than 20% over the next 10 years, right, that, that's a pretty high risk. Remember though, a quarter of all people will die of heart blood vessel disease, right? So, 20% is high over 10 years time, but if you go further out, if you think, uh, think about lifetime risk, the numbers are actually quite high. You know, they're going to be much higher than that. And I would argue that that's okay, right? We're all going to die of something, and if you got rid of all heart disease, we'd all just die of cancer or something else, and then we'd try to fix the cancer. So that, that's sort of been fairly consistent over the last, you know, decades that, you know, there's, there's a, a percentage of folks who will die of, of blood vessel disease. Anything less than 5% is considered low risk. Uh, and then there's this intermediate range between those two uh, margins. Some folks will use the term borderline risk for people who are in this range between 5 and 7.5%. Seven and so let's, as an example, just to get a sense of how this actually plays out, if you took a 65-year-old woman who, uh, Caucasian, because we're in New Hampshire and most of us are, uh, had a cholesterol of 160 and a good cholesterol of 60. That's a pretty good cholesterol panel. And normal blood pressure of 128 over 70, not on any medication for high blood pressure, not a diabetic, not a smoker, 
that person's risk would be about 4.8 percent. Now that's almost 5 percent. That's almost into that borderline zone. But remember, the lifetime risk for you know for all people is going to be uh, you know 25 percent or higher. So so that's that would be something you'd consider low risk. If you make that person a smoker, it basically doubles their risk right away, right? <coughs> So don't smoke is one of the messages that hopefully you've all heard before. Um, if you increase that person's age by 10 years, if you increase their age to 75, it more than doubles it again. And the point that I wanted to make here is that age is a very, very strong risk factor. Right? It, if, you, if you run a lot of people through this calculator, your risk is going to keep getting higher with age. And that's just, that's just sort of um, an unmodifiable fact. And so. Um, it's, it's helpful to understand that, um, but then the question becomes, okay, well, what are we going to do about it? And so we'll come back to that. All right, so we talked, so that sort of addresses the first two bullet points up there. So blood pressure screening, helpful, right? Because blood pressure is something that we can treat, um, and lowering our blood pressure will lower your risk. Uh, and it's also important to know sort of where your cholesterol is, because that is, again, something that's treatable and something that has a direct impact on your uh, risk of heart disease. Some other tests that many of you are probably familiar with, uh, EKGs, very helpful for diagnosing heart attacks and diagnosing electrical problems. Really not helpful at all for, for, for looking in the office to see whether I should be worried about someone having heart blood vessel disease, right? There are, EKGs are not very sensitive, it's basically you know, they put the stickies on your chest and they record the electrical information from your heart as in, and then display it out like this. And it's very prone to saying, you know, if you look at what the computer reads, they often will say, cannot rule out prior heart attack here, cannot rule out prior heart attack there. There are so many ways that an EKG can be abnormal, which in fact is normal, right? So it's not a particularly helpful test in diagnosing a heart blood vessel problem. If you have an EKG at your primary care's office and it's abnormal, usually the right thing to do is to do it again in a couple of weeks. And if it's really abnormal, then they might talk to a cardiologist about whether further testing is necessary. But by and large, this is sort of like a, it's like a, a the analogy would be like a, if you're trying to catch fish and you've got a net that's really fine, you're catching a lot of other stuff, but then there's a lot of big holes in it, so you're letting some of the fish out too. You end up with a mixed bag of everything, and you don't catch everything, and you catch too much sometimes. So I don't use EKGs to diagnose heart blood vessel disease. If you have heart blood vessel disease, or even if you don't, it's not a bad idea to have one on file somewhere so that if you come in really ill or sick or in extremis, uh, then they can compare that and see if there's been a change that can be helpful, but as a one-off in the office, not particularly helpful. Similarly, uh, echocardiography, which, which I think they've talked about in this setting before, this is an ultrasound of the heart, right? Ultrasounds of the heart are much better than the EKG at showing you what the state of your heart is, but again, this is not something that we do routinely for people who are coming into the office. This is a very helpful tool to answer a specific question, why are you short of breath? You know, the valve that was leaking before, how is it doing now? Is it more leaky or less leaky? You know, you've had a heart attack. What's your heart's function? There's a lot of really valuable information you can get from an echocardiogram, but we do not do this routinely if we're looking for a heart blood vessel problem. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about stress testing because stress testing can have value. I don't, in general, do routine stress testing on everybody, again, because you're going to catch some fish that you didn't want and you're going to let some things go that you didn't that you intended to catch but what a stress test is and there's a couple different there's a lot of different ways actually that uh, that we do these and this is what i was doing this morning i was downstairs in our our stress lab and that's where i'll be going this afternoon after we're done here but what we do is we take people and we put them through some sort of stress that could be walking on a treadmill up a grade uh, or it could be a medical stress a chemical stress and then we get information with EKG, or maybe with an echocardiogram, or maybe we do a nuclear test to see where the blood is flowing. And the idea here is that if you have a narrowing in one of your heart arteries, if you have heart blood vessel disease, and we put your heart under stress, we're going to see the effects of that. The heart's going to get weaker, it won't pump as strong, the EKG might change. In general, who needs stress testing? In general, 
with most heart testing, the reason to do a test is because you're having symptoms, okay? So screening tests are, are uncommon and should be used pretty judiciously, right? The reason to do a stress test is if you're having chest pain when you exert yourself, or if you're you know, short of breath more than you normally would, if you're now going for your walks, you, you can't go as far, or you know, you're, you're having symptoms, other symptoms with exertion, and we wonder whether that could be due to, to a heart uh, blood vessel issue, right? So I, identifying heart blood vessel disease in people who have symptoms, whether they've had a heart attack in the past or not, is a, a, a helpful and important role for stress testing. Um, we also use it quite often in people who come into the emergency room having chest pain, and we do the blood work and they're not having a heart attack, and we'll go, well, what is it? Maybe it is a narrowing or a blockage. That person goes to, to a stress test potentially. Um, the, the one time where we do use it most commonly for screening would be for people who are going to have surgery, right? So if you're going to get your knee replaced, for example, and it's limiting your functional ability. So you can't really do a whole heck of a lot because your knee is bad, your, your hip is bad, and so you're pretty sedentary. We want to make sure that you can safely get through surgery. So that's someone who we might recommend a stress test for to make sure the heart is healthy enough to get through the surgery, okay? Because that surgery is going to be more taxing than anything you've done to your body, you know, because of your, your immobility. In general, however, if you're able to get around and you do pretty well, you know, prior to surgery, then we don't usually do stress testing, okay? We used to do a lot more. There's a trend lately to, to try to do less, you know, because it, what we've learned is the more testing we do, the more things we catch, but oftentimes then we end up leading to harm rather than helping people. Uh, other, other potential reasons that we might consider a stress test for people who have poor exercise tolerance, maybe they have risk factors like diabetes and smoking, they want to embark on an exercise program, they haven't done anything for 15 years, and we say, okay, well maybe we put you on the treadmill once while we're watching you and make sure you're safe to do this, and then we give you permission to, to go ahead. Uh, and then we have a bunch of folks who do things like, uh, you know, we get DOT, uh, drivers or, or uh, pilots for the FAA who come in who are required to have routine stress testing. Two other tests on the bottom that I want to point out. One, coronary artery scoring. We're going to come back to this. I think of this as a tiebreaker for people who can't decide whether or not they want to be on a medicine to lower their risk of heart disease, right? So if your doctor is proposing that you go on a cholesterol-lowering medicine, you're just not sure, your risk is somewhere in the, media, in, in the middle there in that, that gray zone, that intermediate range. There are some tests like coronary artery calcium scoring where we can look to see is there plaque that's built up in the heart, is there calcium that's built up, and we use it as a tiebreaker to decide about medication. There's no real role for doing this routinely because most of the time what we're identifying are problems that have been there for a long time, right? So when you see calcium on a CAT scan, that means those blockages have been there, they're sitting there long enough to pick up calcium out of your blood and the, you know, calcium is, is what makes up bone. And so they've been sitting there a while. And those plaques are stable. They're not really changing. So they may be affecting your ability to do things. They may not. But if you're not having symptoms and you've got some, some calcium in your, your arteries, it doesn't necessarily mean that we've got to go in there and fix that, right? Heart catheterization is the way that we fix these blockages, right? So many of you, I'm sure I've known people, some of you may have had a heart cath yourself, a heart catheterization is an, it's an invasive procedure. We've got a couple of colleagues here who, who do it um, every day. They're doing it right now. Uh, where we go in usually through the artery and the wrist these days. We can also go in through the leg. Um, and we bring a little catheter up to those heart arteries. We inject x-ray dye and we take pictures. And we can identify are there narrowings, are there blockages, how bad are they. The problem with this test is it's invasive and there are risks with it. You've got a catheter up by the heart. You can knock off a little plaque. It can cause a heart attack. You can cause a stroke. Those things are uncommon, but it's not something that we do routinely, right? If you're having a heart attack, this is where you want to be. Other than that, you want to stay away. All right, so let's transition now for the last 15 minutes or so and, and talk about how do we modify our risk. And I, I put up a list here just as a summary, and I, and I put a few things here just to mention, again, we don't modify your risk. If we do a, if we do a heart catheterization, and we put a stent in, that does not change your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke, right? You've taken a blood vessel system that's got miles and miles of pipes, and you put a little stent in there that's about two centimeters long, you've done nothing 
about the rest of those blood vessels. Okay, so that's a that's a, a treatment for a, a, a focal problem, but it doesn't address the systemic issues. So the way we systemically lower your risk of a blood vessel problem are things that affect the whole system: diet, activity, not smoking, uh, and then sometimes medication. I also put up here supplements because I get a lot of questions about this from patients. A lot of people say, "I don't want to take a medicine; I'm willing to take a supplement." There are no supplements on the market that have been shown to lower your risk of heart disease. You can go on Google and find a ton of them. They're out there. They are happy to sell you supplements, right? <laughs> Most of these supplements are harmless. Turmeric, probably harmless. Some of them might actually lower your risk marginally. We just haven't studied them well enough. So I'm not going to discard all of them, but I will say there is no data that, that will support the use of any supplement. We've looked at a lot of them, vitamin E, vitamin D, um, a lot of the vitamins, um, and then some of the other, uh, the other supplements have been studied. They don't significantly lower your risk. So rather than taking pills, consider food medicine, eat better, you'll have much more of an effect on your risk, and you'll save yourself some money. All right, so lifestyle measures. Uh, we'll start with the easiest one, which is don't smoke. Um, it's pretty obvious, uh, or, you know, we've known this for many, 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 many years. You've known this since you were kids. Um, smoking will increase your risk of heart attack, stroke, or other blood vessel problem as much as six-fold, six times higher. When we're talking about putting people on medications or doing things, we're talking about lowering their risk by 10, 20 percent, and, and then you go around and pull out a pack of cigarettes and you, you blow it up six times, and everything we've done is, is for naught, right? So if I talk one person out of smoking in a given day, I have done more for our healthcare system in preventing the downstream effects of, of smoking than you know, 10 heart cats, right? Um, so it, don't smoke. If you do smoke, do what you can to stop. We know it's not easy. I don't, I don't say this you know, flippantly. Um, I know it's really hard. I have lots of patients who really want to quit and can't, uh, but encourage people you know who smoke that the best thing they can ever do for their heart health and their overall health is to not smoke. Uh, diet, again, diet, we, I could spend um, an hour. This could be its own talk. Uh, it could be its own series of lectures that you know, run the entire year. Um, and so I think most of us have a sense of what a heart healthy diet is, right? I, I think that a lot of it's common sense. A lot of it our grandparents told us. Um, and a lot of it hasn't really changed. Dietary science is very complicated, right? People who eat healthy tend to do other healthy things, and then it's hard to decide well, why, you know, is, are they healthier because they're eating better or because they're exercising or because they don't smoke? It's confounded, you know, and it's really hard to assign people, okay, you eat unhealthy, you guys don't eat healthy, and then to study them. It's, it, it's very complicated, but at the same time, it's probably more effective to eat healthier than to take any of the medications I can prescribe you. The, the effects of diet are probably, they will lower your risk of heart disease somewhere on the order of 20% to 50%, right? If you, you know, if you take the worst diet compared to the best diet, these are, this is what we call observational data, so it's not like the, the, the strongest data, but clearly, you know, a quote unquote Western diet is not good for, for heart health, right? So what is good? Whole fruits, whole vegetables, whole grains, whole foods in general, lean protein, nuts, legumes, things like that, right? Again, not rocket science. It's not that complicated. I encourage folks not to overthink it, right? Um, we know some things are good for us. We know some things are bad for us, like highly processed sugars and breads, right? That pasta salad, probably not the best. Doesn't mean you can't eat pasta. Just means you probably want to limit it, right? I had ice cream, full disclosure, I had ice cream last night. <laughs> the kids went to bed, there was not enough for everybody, so I waited until they went to bed. <laughs> I was finishing up these slides, and I had some ice cream. Yeah. Um, that's fine, right? Remember, we're, we're talking about you know, years down the road here. The, the effects of your diet extend uh, for your lifetime. <laughs> yeah. um, red meats, processed meats, also, again, moderation, right? Don't, don't have bacon every day. It's, it's, not, it's not good for you. Um, I put up a couple things where, which are uncertain uh, because there has been data. And I often get questions on, 
coffee, can I drink coffee? Is coffee good for me? I read a story somewhere that coffee lowers my risk of heart disease or chocolate lowers my risk of heart disease or red wine lowers my risk of heart disease. Maybe, but my guess is these things are written by people who really like red wine, chocolate, and coffee. I do too, right? Anytime someone is pitching a magic bullet, it's, it's wrong, right? It, it, there's no magic bullet. It's, 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 if it sounds too good to be true, if all you need to do is take this one supplement that, you know, uh, if there's ads on the internet, if it sounds too good to be true, it is, right? It's, it's common sense stuff. Um, I, I tell folks, just some brief tips, keep it simple, right? Just don't overthink it. Pay attention to what you're eating, right? That, that's probably the main way that most commercial diets work is suddenly you're paying attention. Instead of just sort of free range eating all day, now you're paying attention to what's going in your body. You're, you know, you're restricting it perhaps because of whatever diet you're on. Um, some people need a more structured diet program, and that's fine. There are a lot of good ones out there. I don't endorse any one specific diet. I think for the most part, you know, if you're, uh, if you're on a Mediterranean diet or my mom did South Beach, she's also done Weight Watchers, she's done a lot of them, they're probably all better than what you would otherwise be eating, right? And if she's paying attention to what she's eating and she's, you know, limiting her portion sizes and she's cutting out the garbage, then she's doing better uh, than, than what she would have been doing otherwise. Exercise and activity, this is one that might be a little bit harder to see in the back. The text is a little small. I apologize for that. Um, again, like diet, tricky to, to say what exactly the effects of exercise are. People who exercise eat better. People who exercise are less likely to smoke. So how do you tease that apart? It's hard. But again, doing something better than nothing, and that's really clear. People who are sedentary have much higher rates of heart disease, heart blood vessel disease, all other types of disease. Right? You can take people in, in, in some of this data comes from those, like the, the Physician's Health Survey, or the Nurse Health Survey, the, the Framingham uh, group. There are these large trials, large groups of people that they decided that we would watch for decades, and we've been watching the, this group as they age for decades at a time. And it's very clear that people who are more active live longer and, and tend to live better. The, again, the numbers are sort of all over the place, but regular exercise, probably lowers your risk of heart disease by about 30-40%, somewhere in that range. Medications, not going to touch that, right? So staying active is, is one of the best things you can do. Probably, I put it just a half a step below a heart-healthy diet, but uh, really effective. And the nice thing about medication, you know, down to the bottom there, there's, there's really, or, sorry, uh, exercise when compared to medication, all medicines have the potential for side effects. Right? Exercise doesn't. Eating well doesn't. You know, I can't prescribe a statin medication without telling someone there's a chance you might have muscle aches or it might affect your liver function or you, know, or you might just feel kind of foggy. And exercise doesn't do that. Obviously, uh, as someone who has crashed his bicycle while riding home from work, <laughs> you need to be able to exercise safely. But if you can, if you can get over the safety issues, um, then there are really no downsides. And there are additional benefits outside of heart health to exercise, including mobility, you know, mental health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which exercise is best? Honestly, uh, whatever you enjoy is best. Um, and that's what I tell my patients. If you hate exercise like my mom, um, but you don't mind doing water aerobics, then do water aerobics. You know, there was a time where she did Zumba because she's a social animal and there were lots of friends doing Zumba. Um, and so she did it. Whatever you can do regularly is good. Walking for most people is probably enough, right? Most people, you, you, you're not trying to, you, you don't need to run a marathon. You just need to get your heart rate up a bit and, and move your body to, to get the benefits of exercise. In general, there, there's tons of, you, you could spend a whole you know, series of lectures on this alone. Um, exercising 20 to 30 minutes a day, most days of the week, is going to get you most of the way there. Exercising more than that may help a bit. Um, exercising more intensely may be a little bit better, but at the end of the day, those benefits are all, all fairly within the same range. And doing something is better than doing nothing, and doing something regularly is really important, right? So find something that you can do consistently that you enjoy doing, uh, and then do it. All right, we can't go without talking about medication, and we'll start with aspirin. 
um, because this has been in the news a lot, right? So uh, last fall, I believe, it finally leaked into the sort of the lay press, and it was all over the papers and NPR and the TVs. Um, aspirin is a very, very common medication. It's been around forever. It blocks platelets, which are the little particles in your blood that form clots. So if you can keep clots from forming, remember the little picture initially, if you can keep clots from forming, you can keep a blockage from happening. So it makes sense that aspirin will reduce the risk of blockages. The problem with aspirin has always been that those clots are also necessary sometimes. And if you take aspirin, you're going to be more prone to bleeding. So like any blood thinner, more bleeding, less clotting, right? And if you have less clotting, it's going to be, you know, so it's a balance. Um, we, prior to, I think 2018, I think was the last time they had updated things, basically anyone who had an increased risk of heart disease we recommended being on aspirin. And as a result, many, many people between the ages of, you know, 40 on up were on an aspirin to lower their risk of heart attack, to lower their risk of stroke. Men specifically, uh, it, was for, it seemed to prevent heart attacks, women it tend, tended to prevent strokes. For all of these people, it did also increase the risk of bleeding. There were, so the update that came out last fall was based largely on three large trials that enrolled tens of thousands of people that all came out about the same time, 2018 actually. So this has been known to those of us in, in medicine for some time. But when they finally sort of aggregated everything and put out a guideline, they said a lot of people who are on an aspirin may not need to be on an aspirin. And we won't go into those trials in detail, but basically what they showed is Yes, aspirin will lower your risk of heart attack, stroke, and in some cases, death, if you're high enough risk. But for the most part, when we're trying to prevent bad things from happening, if you lower the risk of death from a clotting disorder and increase the risk of death from bleeding too much, those two things balance each other out. And in general, the effects, the, up, you know, the, the, the increased bleeding and the, the decreased clotting, both of those effects were so small but it didn't really seem to make sense for most people to be on an aspirin. There are exceptions to that, and I think the biggest exception is that if you have heart blood vessel disease or other blood vessel disease, this does not apply to you. Lifestyle, diet, all that, that, that applies to you. That's great no matter whether you have disease or not. If you have had a heart attack or a stent or a stroke or something else, you should be on an aspirin. The benefits there are much more clear. This applies to people who don't have a problem. Right. Um, I just made a note there, there may be a small protective effect against colon cancer. It's small, the data is uncertain. You know, if you have a very strong family history of colon cancer, maybe you want to factor that into your decision. Otherwise, for the vast majority of people, you probably don't need to be on an aspirin. Some people who are at a very high risk of blood vessel disease, but particularly if you're, very, if you're young, right, 40, 50 years old, you have a lifetime to accrue that benefit. If your bleeding risk is low, maybe the cost-benefit ratio favors being on an aspirin. That's a decision to make with your doctor. If you're already on an aspirin, you're saying, huh, you're kind of describing me. I don't have any heart blood vessel disease. I have never really had any heart blood vessel problems or other blood vessel problems, but I'm on an aspirin. I wonder if I need to take this. I talk to your doctor. I'm not going to, since I don't know your histories, I'm not going to say, no, don't take it. But you may very well not need it. Uh, finally, statin medications. Uh, these are cholesterol-lowering medications. Everybody knows about them. Many of us are on them. Um, statins are, when it comes to lowering your risk of heart disease, this is where the money is if you're talking about medications. right? Aspirin doesn't really do a whole heck of a lot. Statins work. They work, and they work pretty well. We know from many, many trials of all the different types of statins, in general, statins will lower your risk of heart blood vessel problem, stroke, that sort of thing, by about 20 to 30 percent, 25 percent, right? Which is not insignificant, right? That's a pretty good drop. Now, that drop in 25 percent has to be weighed against the potential side effects, right? So the muscle aches that you hear most frequently about. Um, there may be a slight increased risk in diabetes. Uh, there are that there are some, the whole statins and dementia link is, is pretty tenuous and has never really been shown definitively. Maybe there's something there. People who take statins and feel terrible and come off and feel better, okay. You know, sort of what your own experience guides you. But they work, and they work well. 
they, the, the important thing is when I say 25%, right, that means that it's very individual. If my risk of having a heart attack is only 2%, and I can lower that by a quarter, I go from 2% to a percent and a half. That's a pretty small change. I'm not going to take a medication that might have side effects to make such a minor change. On the other hand, if I'm a, you know, if I'm a diabetic smoking 75-year-old we talked about earlier, and my risk of heart attack is 25%, and I can lower that by a quarter, that's a big drop, and it makes sense to be on a cholesterol-lowering medication. Generally speaking, people who are in that intermediate range, right? So we use that risk calculator to try to get a sense. If you're in that big you know, yellow zone of intermediate risk of a heart blood vessel issue, then you should think about a statin. If you're a high risk, you should be on a statin. If you're in that intermediate risk, that's a conversation with your doctor, and it can be a personalized decision. So in, there's very concrete recommendations, which I'm not going you know, to put up the algorithm. Actually, I think I have it later if people want to look at it. But if you have bad cholesterol that's through the roof, go on a statin, right? If you're a diabetic, you probably ought to be on a statin. If you are in between the ages of 40 and 75% and your risk is somewhere north of 10% and you've got another risk factor, you should probably be on a statin. And if you're sort of around those, you know, if your risk is a little lower than that, then uh, maybe you want to be on a statin, okay? So these are very effective medications. I use them all the time. Many of my patients already have blood vessel disease. They should definitely be on a statin. But if your risk is moderate, then you should think about it. This is the algorithm I was talking about. It's, 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 it's a little complicated, but you can kind of trace yourself through there and figure it out with your doctor. All right, so just to go back to the screening testing, um, so yes, you should have your blood pressure checked. We should know what our blood pressure is. We should treat it if it's high. You should keep an eye on your cholesterol. There are some other labs that we didn't talk about that are sort of a maybe. If you're trying to decide, do I take a statin or not, I don't know. Maybe there are some other labs that you could consider taking. Same thing with the calcium scoring, right? That can be a tiebreaker if you're trying to decide, do I take a statin or not. You probably don't need a stress test. Unless you have an, a problem that we're trying to figure out, you don't need an EKG or an echo or heart catheterization. I put this slide up to remind me that there may be some folks who are older than 75 in this room. You're a special population. Congratulations. The bottom line is it's really hard to study medications in older folks. They are more likely to have effects of the medication. The, the statins are actually more effective in older folks than they are in younger folks. But at the same time, older folks are much more prone to having the side effects, right? Also, then you got to factor in the fact that the whole point of treating people and, and controlling these risk factors is to get you to old age. Once you're there, do you really need to keep taking all these pills? It's sort of a personal decision, right? I'd say, in general, my approach is for people who are very well and have a good functional status and have a good quality of life and whom I would say are probably going to live 10 years or more, I tend to continue these things, right? I tend to think that there's potential benefits to being on the statin that are helpful. On the other hand, if I have someone who's very frail, who's debilitated, who's not doing well, who I don't think is going to be here in five years, then why would I put them on a medication to sort of slightly lower their risk of heart disease or stroke when they have other medical conditions that are just as likely to you know, be affecting the quality of life or the quantity of life going forward. Um, so statins are sort of a special case in the older folks. And, and basically, the current guidelines say, we don't know. It's a pretty, you know, talk to your doctor and decide. Um, I would say, though, that heart-healthy diet and regular physical activity those are good no matter what age you are, right? Not smoking. I guess if you're 90 years old and you're still smoking, uh, you know, I'm not going <laughs> to do, do what you want. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you've earned it. I'm not going to tell you to stop. You'll probably be better off if you do, but that's up to you. All right. Uh, one last note. If you already have heart disease, a lot of what we're talking about preventing heart disease doesn't really apply to you anymore. You really should be on an aspirin. You should be on a statin. Take your medications, control your risk factors, follow up with your doctors, but don't try to let it slow you down. All right? So in summary, uh, heart disease is common. There are simple things you can do. You should understand your risk. You should maybe calculate your risk if you're uncertain. You should 
you probably don't need additional testing beyond just sort of understanding what your risk is. Um, lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle is the most important thing you can do. Some people should be on a statin. Most people don't need to be on an aspirin. All right. I've taken a lot of your time. Um, questions, or you can see me afterwards. I'll, I'll linger here for a few minutes. Questions from Dr. Van Hoff? Great. Oh, yeah. All right. I guess you covered everything. Oh, yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Enjoy, enjoy your potato chips and cookies. On behalf of the entire Concord Hospital Trust staff, I want to thank everyone for being with us today and thank those of you who are watching uh, through YouTube or Facebook. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Van Hoff, thank you for a fabulous presentation. Very simply put on ways that we can understand our heart risk and what we can do about it. So thank you very much. Uh, next month is October, and uh, we will continue our tradition of dedicating October to breast cancer awareness and breast cancer issues. Dr. Jenna Walsh from the breast, uh, Concord Hospital of Breast Care Center will be here. She will be talking about metastatic breast cancer.